So I am going to talk to you about our outcome study that Max has mentioned um, as part of his presentation. And so as part of the RCT that Max talked about, we also did an outcome study and we recruited, we recruited additional participants into that um, counselling and options um, standard care arm. Um, and our outcome study reports on this standard care arm. Um, our results at 12 months have been uh, presented at previous forums and today I'm going to talk to you about how the clients were doing three years later. So at three, six and 12 months we looked at outcomes for the help seekers that called the gambling helpline and received that standard care intervention which involved kind of brief reflective counselling um, and options for face-to-face -face services. So there were, um, we were looking at the differences in outcomes for those receiving this telephone assistance only versus those who also went on to access additional services over and above that. That was something we were particularly interested in. We were also interested in the client characteristics that were associated with treatment outcome. Um, so what, what, what kinds of characteristics um, were associated with whether people did well or, or not so well. And the, obviously the purpose of the additional 36 month follow up was to assess how durable those outcomes were over time and to kind of identify and further clarify some of those predictors of treatment success which we all want to know about. So we had, after recruiting some extra people, we had 150 participants, 57% uh, female, and the, this, our sample was broadly consistent with what the, the population um, was that was accessing the helpline at the time. Uh, Max has touched on our, um, our attrition. We did obviously lose people to the study over time, but we didn't lose them in any kind of systematic way. Um, uh, there wasn't any differential attrition in our study. Our measures covered self-report days gambled, money lost, treatment goal success, as well as people's self-reported control over their gambling, um, the, the kind of impacts that gambling was having on their various life areas, work, home, family, uh, as well as PGSI. We looked at psychiatric comorbidity, psychological distress, and um, uh, those comorbid issues with tobacco, drug, and alcohol use as well. So what did we find at 36 months? Similar to the RCT, really good things happened. Uh, for our gambling outcome measures, we saw um, substantial improvements from baseline to the three months in terms of the days that people were spending on gambling, the dollars that they were losing, and the, the amount of control that they had and they felt they had over their gambling. Um, and that was sustained at 36 months. A similar story with the life areas um, affected by gambling. This was a 10 point scale, and the, yeah, the scale's a little bit confusing there, but we did see vast improvements within that first three months on those different life areas, work, social life, family and home, and health. Uh, and we also saw slight improvements that continued to be noted at, at 12 months and 36 months. So these things seem to be improving um, even more over time. The top graph there is PGSI median score and we looked at that in a 12 month time frame as well as a three month time frame. And you can see those median scores um, decreasing over time. Uh, the median score at 12 months was half that at baseline and reduced even further at 36 months to just five. And with our PGSI 3, we can see those substantial improvements within the first three months. Um, that was then maintained at six and 12. And we saw a further substantial decrease in, in PGSI 3 at 36 months, which we were quite excited about, um, down to a median of two. So down to a median of, of um, being in that low risk gambler category. Uh, when we look at categorisation um, of problem gambling using the PGSI, uh, we had almost all of our participants at baseline were classified as problem gamblers using a cutoff score of eight or above, uh, and which reduced down to 58% at 12 months and even fewer at 36 months. So although having said that, we did still have 38.3% people um, showing up as problem gamblers at 36 months. 
And we do, as Max sort of touched on, we do like to kind of contextualise that a little bit further. And I think we can do that, like thinking about those, those two-thirds of gamblers, um, uh, two-thirds problem gambling or moderate risk uh, a bit further when we look at the PGSI items themselves. So what we found at 36 months was that the items that were endorsed most often were the likes of number five, seven, and nine here. So how often have you felt that you might have a problem with gambling? How often have you felt guilty about the way you gamble? How often have you, have all your household experienced financial problems? And these are things that are likely or could potentially persist for quite a long time in people's lives. And what that means is that it's possible that, that people are um, identified as problem gamblers at the 36 month point, but may not even be actually gambling at the, at the moment. So um, that's something that yeah, we just kind of talk about to try and contextualize the fact that yeah, we did find uh, that people were still in that category at 36 months. Um, something that we do need to do and that we would like to do is to uh, look at the way that people's responses to these different items changed over time and that could help shed a little bit more light on, on um, what's going on with that. So it's likely that, that some of these that responses to some of these questions could change quite quickly and that others might take quite a long time. The story with psychological distress was also a good one. Uh, using the, we use the K10 in the, in the top graph there, and you can see the amount of distress shifting quite dramatically within that first three months. Uh, and at 36 months, we had just 3% of people being classified as experiencing um, high distress, compared to over 50% 50 50 at um, baseline, so that's quite a big difference. Uh, the bottom graph there is looking at um, affective disorders, and we did see uh, significant improvements in both major and minor depressive disorders, not so much for dysthymia and, uh, and bipolar, which are thought to be kind of more chronic conditions um, and not, not, we wouldn't expect them to change as much as depression. Bit of a different story with alcohol and substance use. Um, not a lot of change over time. We saw slight reductions in smoking across the different time points, uh, and alcohol actually rose, um, alcohol abuse actually rose from baseline to six months. Uh, whoops, actually it went down from baseline to six months. However, at 12 and 36 months, it rose again to over 60%. So um, not so much change there, which we think does point to the, some of the specificity of the intervention that was delivered by the helpline in terms of how it affected um, gambling and not so much these other issues. And whilst most people didn't report drug abuse, um, those experiencing problems did reduce. But you know, you can see quite clearly from these graphs that the effect on other issues is not so strong as it is with the gambling impact areas. So we were interested in the amount of additional uh, assistance that people access because you know, we're, we're really interested in minimal interventions and whether people find them helpful and whether they work long term. So um, what we did find was that uptake of additional assistance beyond that helpline um, standard care intervention was set at around about a third um, during the first three months post-intervention and declined to about 13% at 36 months. So um, although I mean, an interesting finding that we, that we found was that although many people did access that additional support, um, accessing that additional support wasn't related to outcomes, so it didn't seem to predict better or worse outcomes in our study. So when we look at uh, some of the predictors of the successful outcomes, and uh, this one in terms of PGSI, Actually being employed was the only significant demographic variable that predicted uh, successful outcomes in terms of PGSI. Um, when we looked at our, um, on its own, when we looked at multivariate analyses, we saw better outcomes for people who were partnered, who'd had no, and also for people who'd had no previous treatment for mental health issues um, or gambling. in terms of trying to predict how in control of their gambling people felt. Um, the more socioeconomic deprivation people were experiencing and the lower quality of their life, 
um, the less improvement um, was seen in, in their control over gambling, which, yeah, kind of makes sense. And also um, belief in treatment success was associated with improvements in control. So coming back to that point about additional treatment again, um, those two thirds did receive some additional assistance, so they went out, they, they went out and got additional treatment beyond that helpline um, conversation. Um, mostly they accessed that in the first three months, and also encouragement to do that was kind of built into that standard care approach. So people were given the options for face to face and, and encouraged to, to um, seek out the services that they felt that they required. Um, and we know that we know that uh, New Zealand problem gambling services in terms of face-to-face -face services are quite varied and, and um, they're also widely available. And that's uh, something that the impact on, on our outcomes was something we couldn't really control for, if that makes sense. Um, so receiving additional assistance wasn't associated with outcomes, but as Max has touched on, we can't infer that additional treatment wasn't beneficial because people chose to access that, that additional treatment. They weren't allocated to receive it or, or anything like that. Um, and it may be that um, that additional treatment contributes um, not too much extra, or it could be that you know that unaccounted for variability that we couldn't measure in terms of what it was exactly that people got when they accessed that face-to-face -face, uh, treatment um, has kind of messed with our results a bit. Or it could be that people are relatively accurate in determining what they need and when they need it. Uh, and that, as Max has said, you know, without getting the, that additional treatment, people may have done worse. So we know that we know, we all know that there's high co-occurrence of problem gambling with all sorts of issues like alcohol and substance misuse, um, anxiety and affective disorders. And in our study, we found we actually found improvements in distress and depression that are quite comparable with outcomes um, of studies who, who have looked at really specialised therapies for those disorders. And com in comparison, we found relatively low improvement in tobacco and alcohol use and abuse. And this has implications for treatment. Um, it, it does suggest that perhaps additional referral or treatment is warranted for people who are uh, also experiencing tobacco, um, tobacco issues and alcohol abuse, um, especially given the recent uh, discussion around how uh, comorbid addictive behaviours might actually provide relapse triggers for gambling and also uh, work to kind of limit the long-term effectiveness of treatment. So something else to keep in mind. Um, also to keep in mind is that Something that hasn't really been talked a lot about in the literature is how acceptable to clients um, additional referral is for different issues and uh, also looking at what might be the impact on somebody's gambling related goals and gambling related treatment experiences if they are being encouraged to seek additional more specialised treatment for um, the likes of tobacco and, and alcohol use. Something important to kind of to look into I think. So in our analysis, we also looked at what were the factors that were associated with, with worse outcomes for people. And um, we think this is important because it might help us identify the client groups who could benefit from that more intensive support. Um, so, you know, as Max has said, we could have the stepped care, we could, you know, we could target our resources at people who might actually benefit from that more intensive support. And looking at, when we looked at PGSI 12, which was one of our key clinical measures, we saw that factors associated with worse outcomes were having illness, being on sick leave, uh, being widowed and being without a partner, and also having previously received treatment for either mental health or for gambling issues. Um, other out, uh, factors associated with worse outcomes on our other key outcome measures, so our days and our dollars and our amount of control over gambling, were high PGSI 12, as you'd expect, um, low quality of life, low self-efficacy at baseline, as well as, related to the previous um, point, past year mental health treatment. So we think that uh, previous formal help seeking might actually indicate comorbidity, obviously, and more chronic gambling problems um, as something else important to keep in mind with, um, with treatment.
So the other thing, uh, interesting thing about our study is that all of those factors that were associated with worse outcomes were only associated with worse outcomes on a single outcome measure. So they weren't global predictors of, of treatment outcomes for, the, for our sample. So at both the 12 and 36 month follow up, we actually found both clinically and statistically significant improvements uh, in, people's, um, in people's gambling and those other, those other issues that we measured that were irrespective of the likes of age, gender, ethnicity, and almost all the socio-demographic and baseline characteristics that we considered. So to sum up, we found significant improvements in gambling and related problems 36 months after a brief telephone intervention, which we think is pretty cool as well as additional improvements in the days that the number of days that people gambled, median PGSI, and also the proportion of problem gamblers in the sample. We found similar outcomes to trials and outcome studies of face-to-face -face therapy. Uh, so this is with a very minimal intervention in comparison. And additional treatment wasn't associated with better outcomes. So we're suggesting that Perhaps most gamblers don't require long, intensive duration face-to-face -face interventions, but there is a challenge there in terms of how we might identify people that could or, or will need those, those long-term interventions in order to improve and sustain that improvement. Uncontrolled outcome studies like ours have their limitations. There is no random allocation. Uh, there are many confounding factors that we couldn't account for. Um, and as always, large sample RCTs are important to establish uh, a bit more um, concretely which clients might respond better to which sorts of treatments. Um, with, with this research into minimal interventions, you know, there is a cost-benefit kind of, kind of thing going on behind it. And now of course, the assessments of costs of treatment programs relative to the outcomes and benefits is important. Um, something that people are very interested in, and it is something that we're incorporating a bit more explicitly into our new face-to-face -face trial of, um, of services in New Zealand. So this is my last slide, which is just to say thank you to our participants, our gamblers that took part in the study, uh, the Gambling Helpline, which is now part of Home Care Medical, However, Sue Hohaya is here, who was involved in the, in the trial and was, was a, um, in management at the Gambling Helpline at the time, so thank you, Sue. As well as the students who did a lot of our follow-up work, our funder, the Ministry of Health, and this says the report will be available. The report is available on the Ministry of Health website and our Gambling and Addictions Research Centre website as well. So thank you.